Well, it's my uh, real pleasure as a fellow geographer uh, to introduce uh, Dr. M. Dwayne Nellis. Uh, he is the 21st president of Ohio University and an internationally recognized scholar and national higher education leader. Prior to arriving in Ohio in 2017, Dr. Nellis served as the president of University of, Ohio, of Idaho and uh, most recently Texas Tech University in Lubbock. He's recognized uh, nationally and internationally for his research that utilizes satellite data and geographic information systems to analyze various dimensions of the Earth's land surface. This research has been funded by more than 50 sources, such as NASA, the National Geographic Society, the U.S. Agency for International Development, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Dr. Nellis received his bachelor's degree in Earth Sciences and Geography at Montana State University and his master's and doctoral degrees in geography from Oregon State University. So please help me welcome Dr. Nellis. Well, thank you, Tim, and it truly is a pleasure to be here tonight and, uh, and welcome you all to the Ohio uh, Settlement Conference. And uh, the theme for the Conference of Settling Ohio First Nations and Beyond is such an important theme, and we're proud to have so many experts taking part in the uh, presentations and discussions this week. Uh, but before I get be, begin, I wanted to uh, to again thank some of the people that have been involved. Tim mentioned some of them, but I wanted to particularly call out Tim Anderson and Brian Shane for their uh, for their leadership in really organizing this. And if they just stand and let's give them a round of applause, Tim Anderson and Brian Shane, appreciate it. I don't remember exactly when it was, but <laughs> maybe six months ago or so, when Brian and Tim came to my office to talk about this idea they had, and, uh, and I was very interested and intrigued and wanted to be supportive of this. But, uh, but there are many uh, uh, people that have been supportive and entities, so the people like the department, groups like the Department of History, uh, the Department of Geography, the Southeast Ohio History Center and Director Jessica Siders, uh, the Central Regional Humanities Center at Ohio University, the Charles Ping Institute for the Teaching of the Humanities, uh, Professor Nancy Stevens and the uh, Ohio Museum Complex, uh, Dr. Tanisha King-Taylor, student uh, David uh, Schumann, and Dr. Brian Shane, uh, all part of the work on the Black History MAP Athens uh, tour as well. So I appreciate the work there. One of the goals of this um, uh, conference, which started as you know today and will continue tomorrow, so I hope you, uh, many of you will be able to attend the very interesting talks that are on the uh, schedule for tomorrow as well. But one of our goals is uh, to highlight uh, higher education and the role that it played in, uh, in the Northwest Territory. And uh, here at Ohio University, we're proud that we were established in 1804 uh, and helped to establish models and standards that were replicated elsewhere throughout the 1800s. And uh, as many of you know, we were one of the oldest public universities uh, in the United States. Although I was reminded that even though it's, uh, we just celebrated our 216th uh, birthday here earlier this week. Uh, uh, in December, I was over at Leipzig University, and they were celebrating their 610th uh, <laughs> uh, birthday. So uh, we were a little bit young, uh, younger in that context. So uh, in some ways, it re references uh, a scale of, of time that sometimes we forget about in the context of even what was going on in this area. Uh, not only hundreds of years ago, but thousands of years ago. So it's important to remember, too, that Ohio became a state in 1803, and our university was integral to the growth of the state and the region. And while this conference will focus on the beginnings of Anglo-European settlement, we know that the first people in what is now Ohio arrived more than 13,000 years ago more than 13,000 years ago. So even when I was in Leipzig, 610, and then referenced 13,000 years ago. And these native peoples overcame a lot of, of challenges, things like rapid climate change, 
for those of us that are geographers, we know about uh, continental glaciation and some of the things that were happening in this part of uh, what is now North America. Uh, and these native peoples uh, built some of the first uh, um, um, homes and, and became the first people to clear land and to uh, produce food on this land. Our speakers will shed more light on individuals and groups who not only have not always received, I should say, the attention they deserve, and this includes the indigenous populations as well as African Americans and immigrants. One final goal of this conference is to present this information to scholars, students, and community members, and so I know our audience tonight is very diverse in that context as well, and we appreciate you uh, being here and your interest. This conference will pre uh, present lively discussions, hopefully, and I think they've already occurred. I was asking people that attended earlier today, there's been a lot of really good questions and dialogue around historical subjects that we need to certainly learn more about. So tonight's keynote speech is a wonderful example of this, and we're very thankful to have with us tonight Dr. Anna Lisa Cox, an award-winning historian whose newest book, The Bone and Sinew of the Land, was honored by the Smithsonian Magazine as one of the best history books of 2018. Dr. Cox was a recent research associate at the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, where her original research underpinned two of their exhibits. Her writing has been featured in a number of publications, including the North Star, uh, Lampum's Quarterly, and the New York Times. And she's currently a non-resident fellow at Harvard University's Hutchins Center for African and African American Research. Tonight, she will be speaking on a really fascinating topic, and I'm really, uh, really anxious to hear her comments. Uh, that the, the title of her talk is What If Manasseh Cutler Was Black? The Hidden History of the Diverse Pioneers Who Created Ohio. And those of us here at Ohio University know, of course, about the role of Manasseh Cutler and also people like Rufus Putnam, but it, we're really looking forward to your perspectives. Most of us have not been uh, taught much about these diverse pioneers, and I'm, I'm again, really looking forward to her comments. Among our speakers on Saturday, we're really proud to welcome Chief Glenna Wallace of the Eastern Shawnee Nation. Uh, Chief Wallace, where are you at here? I know you're here, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, let's give her a round of applause as well. Thank you. <laughs> Chief Wallace will speak on taking care of business, balancing history and legacy. So I'm thankful for all of our speakers. We have people that have come from all over the United States and certainly within our region. And um, again, uh, our founders 216 years ago played an important role in the history of our state, uh, and I'm talking about Ohio University, just as our students, alumni, faculty, and staff have done and continue to do. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to learn more about our history with you here tonight as we hear from our distinguished guest. So now it's my honor to welcome to the stage tonight's keynote speaker, Dr. Lisa Anna Cox. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm very glad to be here. Um, before I get started, I will say, could everybody turn off their cell phones? This is something I'm terribly guilty at uh, about doing, so I'm going to ask you that. Also, I have heard rumors that there's going to be a reception after the talk um, with a bar, right? So um, if people do not actually have the time to get in a question to me after this talk, please, I will be um, at the reception afterwards, and I'm happy to talk to you there. Um, I also, my thanks to Ohio University and the president, and particularly to Dr. Tim Anderson and to Dr. Brian Shane, who worked so hard to make this conference happen. I also want to thank some important people who are not here, the African American historians I've worked with and whose work has revealed important facts about Ohio's past, most notably Dr. Stephen Middleton, Dr. Nikki Taylor, and Dr. Charles LaRoche. I wish they could be here, 
but I, I just want to let you know I stand on their shoulders and I, I walk with them. I'm proud to have them as colleagues. So I'm going to get started. I promise I won't drone on for too long. This will only go about 45 minutes, and then we're going to end with um, a brief speech uh, by Dr. Uh, sorry, by Mr. David Butcher, who's um, a local and very renowned person in my estimation, He's descended from early African descended pioneers in this area. So what if Manasseh Cutler was black? The hidden history of the diverse pioneers who created Ohio. So I'm going to start with a story. And it starts in 1839, which is fairly late in Ohio's settlement, I know. But this is an important chapter in Ohio's past that reveals much. So it's Portage County, Ohio, in the deep countryside, roughly 30 miles south of Cleveland. There had long been settled and successful African-American farmers in that county. And by 1839, they organized and financed a lovely grammar school for their youngest children because the white county leaders refused to build them a school with the tax money they had taken from those black propertied farmers. Finding a teacher had been a challenge, but they finally found Clarissa Wright, a young white woman willing to come on her own to live with these farmers and teach their children. Clarissa Wright knew exactly what she was getting into. She had been born and raised in Portage County, Ohio. Her father had been educated at Yale and come from Connecticut to Ohio around 1810. He founded a school called the Talmadge Academy. Clarissa Wright and her siblings were educated there by their firmly anti-slavery father, who also was a proponent of equal education for boys and girls. What a revolutionary. One of those boys was the young John Brown, the fierce white abolitionist who would later lead the attack at Harper's Ferry. Clarissa and her brother, Eliza White, Poor guy, I feel so bad for him. I hope he wasn't beaten up. Eliza, that is actually his name, were committed advocates of freedom and equality for all Americans. They had personally witnessed the race wars that had arisen in almost all the cities of the North in the 1830s, from Cincinnati to New York. In 1833, Eliza Wright had helped to create the National American Anti Slavery Society on the East Coast. But unlike some of his fellow white abolitionists, he was a staunch anti-colonizationist, believing that African-descended people had a right to freedom and full American citizenship in the nation they had fought for and helped to found. While the school was in Portage County, it may have been far enough from her home that Clarissa needed a place to live nearby. In those days, teachers usually boarded with a family involved in the management of the school. In this case, it would have been an African-American family. There should have been nothing upsetting about this. Education was supposed to be a core value in Ohio, a central pillar of a healthy democracy. Indeed, the men who wrote the founding document of the Northwest Territory the Territorial Ordinance of 1787 considered education so important that they included specific mention of schools, noting in Article 3, religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall be forever encouraged. And I'm just, I have to have that document up here. So. This is what the United States looked like in 1794. We've got the Northwest Territory. I'm assuming most of you know what that is. These are usually slides I have to show up to people on the coasts. And here's a bit of that ordinance. And just as in the voting clauses in the ordinance, none of those instructions mentioned race or the exclusion of any group which meant that the region that would become Ohio, as well as the states of Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and a smidge of Minnesota, had equal voting rights for all American men, regardless of the color of their skin. But this was 1839, over 50 years since the ordinance had been written, and much 
had changed. There were so many immigrants to the area. Between 1787 and 1837, around 4 million people had moved into the Northwest Territory, a region that was the rightful home of the Native American people here. This was one of the largest movements of human beings from one region of the planet to another to have occurred up until this time. It's amazing the Earth didn't just tip a little bit. But back to Clarissa Wright in Portage County. In her case, it was just a matter of African Americans and whites working together on a common goal of education. No big deal, right? But these prejudiced whites around her had an easily offended sense of their own identity, and they were quick to come to wrath when a case arose where the order they wished to impose in America, white men on top and everyone else below, was challenged. The idea that a white woman would not only be equal to, but dependent on, wealthy African American farmers for her livelihood was not to be tolerated. And the fact that she was also helping the children of these farmers be educated to have an equal opportunity for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness was not just an insult. It was a killing offense. First, a threatening letter was sent to the African-American farmers who were running the school, informing them that if they did not fire right immediately, they would gather together for a meeting and, I quote, consider the situation, end quote. This was a threat, for everyone knew in those troubled times that when powerful white men gathered other white people for a meeting, they were planning violence. When the African Americans who had hired Wright refused to respond to the letter, another letter was sent a few days later, filled with obscene slander and threat. Now, there was an intimacy to this hatred. Rural communities were small and scattered, but that did not mean that people did not know each other or know each other's business. It was not just letters sent. It would have been people walking out of the general store to avoid seeing a neighbor. It would have been a rider galloping by on a horse, cursing a family as he passed. It might have been two men inside a home, sitting on chairs, sipping something hot. Those two men were a visiting white abolitionist, Amzie D. Barber, who was invited to the home of a Mr. McMullen, whom the abolitionist described as an influential white man in that area. Barber was white himself, and he almost certainly knew Clarissa Wright and had come to her aid. He was a secretary of the Cincinnati Anti-Slavery Society and had briefly run a school for African Americans in that city in 1836. During their conversation, McMullen was more explicit about the threat to Clarissa, boldly threatening that a mob would burn the schoolhouse if Wright did not stop teaching there. McMullen kept assuring Barber that he would not hurt Wright or personally burn down the school. But Barber called his bluff, replying, and I quote, I have no fear of violence unless some influential men encourage it. And the very way to get up a mob is for every white man to prophesy that there will be one. This so upset McMullen that he called Bar Barber the worst thing he could think of, an abolitionist. He accused him of preaching abolition to the African Americans in the township, to which Barber replied, and I quote, I have never given an abolition lecture to the colored people. There is no occasion for it. If they were in favor of slavery, they would go to the South and put their own necks under the yoke. Barber probably took courage from the fact that many whites in Ohio had arisen to combat the rising prejudice in their state, which was now home to over 200 anti-slavery societies that would be reading and repeating his words that he knew would be reprinted in an abolitionist newspaper. He may have been pleased with his wit in his argument with McMullen, but no argument between a young abolitionist and a powerful white man in an Ohio farming community would stop the threats to Clarissa and the families and children she was teaching. A few days later, 
Clarissa wrote that she was now receiving the threats personally and that they included plans to tar and feather her and ride her out of the county on a rail. Elijah Lovejoy, the white abolitionist, had endured threats of similar abuse in Illinois, but the fact that the threat targeted Clarissa Wright, a young white woman, was significant. Everyone knew that if a person, first stripped of their clothing, even managed to survive the coating of hot tar, their being forced to straddle a thin, splintered rail was a form of sexual assault. Indeed, I've come across numerous threats and actual cases of white women being assaulted in this way by other whites in the old Northwest Territory states for the crime of crossing the color line, whether teaching African-American children or marrying an African-descended man. But Clarissa Wright would not give up. She stood with the African-descended farmers and they stood with her. Sorry. At the risk of terrible violence and loss. Her brother had been stabbed and almost killed by two attackers during the 1834 race war in New York City because of his support of equality for all Americans. She knew that threats of violence could have very real consequences. She was not naive, nor were the African Americans who had hired her, as she wrote, and I quote, Should I fall victim to the fury of these wicked men, it is but little that they can do. The thought of departing from Christ is more dreadful than death, end quote. This is a radical statement, for it not only asserted that the cause of equal education was a blessed one, but it equated the children she was teaching with Christ himself. No wonder some of the local whites wanted her gone. While Clarissa Wright seems to have escaped alive, there is little record of what happened to the school or the children she was trying to teach. And this event sums up in so many ways the complicated history of race relations in antebellum Ohio. Whites fighting with whites over questions of equal rights. African Americans allying themselves with supportive whites even as other whites tried to destroy them. But what interests me not so much is not just Clarissa Wright, but the families who built that school. The free black pioneers who came out to Ohio to buy good land and farm it well. Without their history, we have no way of understanding Ohio's history or the history of the Midwest before the Civil War and after. And there were so many of them, more than historians have thought or maybe even thought possible. I'm just going to show you a map from my book. So this is um, a map that shows just the farming settlements where property African-descended farmers lived uh, and successfully uh, farmed their land before the Civil War. The long-held assumption is that African Americans in the North and the Midwest were primarily urban, an assumption shaped by the great migration of the 20th century. But before that movement, there was a first great migration, the movement of tens of thousands of free African Americans onto the Northwest Territory and later states. Many of them came to the region before there were even cities. And their goal was not just to survive, but to thrive. They bought land from the federal gov government, some of them buying hundreds of acres, which turned them into the equivalent of landed gentry. By 1860, there were over 330 settlements that were home to African American farmers in the old Northwest Territory states, on their own land, many of them market farmers. And this number is conservative. So I work closely with Professor Henry Louis Gates Jr. at the Hutchins Center. And when I was first starting this project, he gave me a good piece of advice. He sat me down, he actually shook his finger in my face and he said, do not exaggerate your claims. <laughs> he said, if you think you found what you found, do not exaggerate your claims. So I have not. This is a deeply conservative map. And sometimes I regret how conservative it is, but it is only people who are self-identifying as farmers farming. So it doesn't include 
rural general store owners, blacksmiths, mill owners, um, riverboat men, right? There's so many other property and successful and wealthy African-American entrepreneurs who are living across this region. They're not counted here. And this is significant. So for example, you can see Michigan has sort of a scattering down in the south, especially sort of in the southern section of the state. But in 1853, when the state of Michigan ran its own state census, it found that all but eight counties in the state of Michigan, including the UP, had African descended residents, all but eight. Okay. This means that before the Civil War, the Midwest, the rural Midwest, was more diverse than it is today. Not equal, the two do not mean the same thing, but diverse. I also have to add here that words like pioneer and frontier are not uncomplicated. There were other people here first on this land, the native peoples for whom this land was home. This space was a place of horrific violence war and genocide long before schools for black children were being burned. And the irony is that many of the African descended homesteaders who came out to the early Ohio frontier were themselves multiracial, carrying within their bodies many ethnicities, Narragansett, Igbo, Scottish, indigenous Caribbean, Dutch, North African, German, the list could go on and on. But while historians have begun to acknowledge the realities of the Native American experience in the Northwest Territory, the facts of the pioneers of color have been all but ignored, erased, suppressed. But back to those number of settlements, numbers so much higher than historians have thought possible. And there should have been more. Many of you will have heard about the Black Code laws anti-immigration and unjust prejudice laws created to make it harder for people of African descent to settle in Ohio. These laws had very real impact. Apologists for these laws have argued that because there were so many African Americans in Ohio that the laws could not have been effective. But this is using a white perspective. For the African descended citizens of Ohio, these laws were described by them as, and I quote, the unjust written manacles for the free. We cannot know how many more African American pioneers would have settled in Ohio during its early settlement period, when federal land was at its most plentiful and cheap. And early does matter in terms of success if these prejudiced anti-immigration laws did not exist. As I find more settlements, practically daily, that were home to these African-descended landowners, I'm coming to the awareness that every county in the old Northwest Territory states had African-descended people who wanted to live there. And if there are none there today, then they were kept out or chased out by whites who settled around them sometimes after these African-American pioneers arrived. As we think about this population, I hope that it can change the way we think about the fact of Ohio's past. The history of African descended people in Ohio and the Northwest Territory is not a peripheral history, an add on to the real history of Ohio. Instead, the issues of race and equality were central to the formation of Ohio and the old Northwest Territory states. Indeed, the issue of race consumed many of the white men who wrote Ohio's first state constitution and its earliest legislations and laws. They worked hard to reverse the clearly written terms of the Northwest Territorial Ordinance, which granted all propertied men the right to vote regardless of race, adding in the word white to that first state constitution, successfully stealing the right to vote from the very black men who had voted for some of those white men to represent them in that first state constitutional convention. 
They debated the issues, talked about them, and some were even willing to take up arms and risk their lives for them. Yes, take up arms. Recently, the Watchmen series has introduced many Americans to the history of the Tulsa Race War of, eight, of 1921. But long before there was even a city of Tulsa, Ohio saw one of the nation's earliest race wars. As many of you already know, in 1829, Cincinnati was hit by a race war in which whites rose up to drive out propertied and thriving African-American entrepreneurs and families from the city those African-Americans had helped to found. And I don't believe it is any accident that the 1829 legislation on education also was written that same year, and it stated, and I quote, nothing in this act contained shall be so construed as to permit black or mulatto persons to attend the schools hereby established. End quote. This was another kind of violence. Yes, Ohio University should be justly proud of the fact that in 1828, the African-American John Templeton graduated from this university. But the passage of this 1829 law could well have been a backlash against his very graduation. And by passing this law and the subsequent land-grant laws of the 1830s, written to create a public school system in Ohio, race was specifically kept in mind. Every legislation from this period stressed that Ohio's land-grant school system was, and I quote, for the instruction of white youth, end quote. By cutting off the opportunity for education, these white leaders in Ohio were curtailing the ability of African Americans to attend university for without an education to lead them there, they were effectively cut off from entry. True, exceptions were made for separate schools for African Americans to be built from taxes raised from black property owners in the area. But if there were no black property owners, maybe they were on their own riverboat on the Ohio, then there was no funds for those schools. And even places where there were, like Cincinnati, the mention of even building such a school was enough to start another race war in 1841. In that year, after 105 African-American property holders in the city had signed a petition demanding a school be built with the tax money that had been taken from them, the city leaders finally agreed. But the Brock brothers would have none of it. The Brock brothers had started their newspaper in Cincinnati in 1841 which seemed intent upon inciting ire against African Americans. The Brock brothers had been passionate supporters of President Jackson, and even after his presidency was over, their newspaper was full of divisive reporting, panic stories of the evils of equality, and the terrors that free African Americans supposedly inflicted on whites. In the summer of 1841, their pet cause was the city's decision to support that school for African American children. The Brock brothers worked hard to raise the wrath of their white readers against every form of equality for African Americans, writing that the idea of schools was a waste and would give African American children, and I quote, pretensions and privileges that they neither deserve nor appreciated. Soon they were calling for violence against the African Americans of Cincinnati, and when that violence broke out in August, it was terrible. Whites raided a federal armory for weapons, including a cannon that was used against African-American homes and businesses. And there was a Captain Brock mentioned as leading a white militia in Cincinnati during this race war. This Captain Brock, possibly one of the editors of the paper, became notorious for his unwillingness to keep the peace or defend African-American lives and homes during the 1841 race war. But education is just one issue of many in early Ohio in which race was inextricably intertwined. It affected all aspects of life in Ohio in the late 1700s and first half of the 1800s. But let me be devil's advocate. How could it? After all, some statistical historians could look at this map, think about these numbers, and argue 
that the numbers are too low to have an impact. But we have to think about the visibility of these pioneers and their successes. One of the best examples I can think of is the movie Hidden Figures. I don't know if many of you have seen that film. It's about um, African-American uh, women mathematicians who worked at NASA in the 1960s. And there's a scene in that film in which one of these brilliant mathematicians is invited into a top secret meeting room. And it's filled with white men, right? Uh, there are Navy officers and, and um, scientists. She walks into that room, statistically, she's a very, very small number of African Americans in that room. But she stands in front of all of them, in front of a blackboard, and does these brilliant mathematical equations, figuring out exactly where a spaceship is going to land in the ocean, right? Her Im impact on that room is much higher than her numbers. And I think we need to start thinking about African descended pioneers in that term, not just statistically, but their symbolic impact. One of my favorite examples of a highly impactive early Ohio pioneer is William Kenny. William Kenny was an African descended man brought from England by his enslaver to British held Fort Detroit in the 1790s. He freed himself running south, south, into the Ohio Territory and freedom. Literate, bright, and determined, Kenny was quickly hired to work as a clerk for a territorial judge in Ohio. And I keep thinking of all the white men who filed to the court of that territorial judge, seeing William Kenny. A few years after taking his position, Kenny courageously wrote a letter to the man who, held him in, who had once held him in bondage, like the men who had written the Declaration of Independence only a few years earlier, Kenny was writing to inform his old master that he would forever be free from tyranny. Kenny was obviously well accustomed to the formalities required in letter writing in that period, in which writers would sign, your obedient servant. But instead, Kenny wrote in his letter, no more at present, but still remains your obedient servant. And then there is the labor required to actually farm a large farm on the frontier of Ohio, long before the McCormick Reaper, right? And I'll just quickly sum it up because oh, it may sound boring, but it's incredibly important to how the, the impact of these farmers, plowing. If you're walking behind a single-bladed plow pulled by a team of oxen, you have to walk nine miles on rough mud to plow one acre of land. Nine miles. If you have 100 acres under cultivation, you're basically walking to Washington, D.C. and back every spring, barefoot. And harvesting is even harder. One of the top crops was grain, wheat. That's going to get you the most money. And if you're interested in being a market farmer, and some of these African-American farmers were, they had 700 acres under wheat cultivation. In order to harvest wheat, it takes a really healthy, fairly young, very knowledgeable laborer an entire day to harvest a quarter acre of wheat with a scythe, just a quarter acre. So if you have 700 acres under wheat cultivation, in 1840, you have to hire basically everybody around you, white or black, to harvest your wheat for you. Not surprisingly, some of these landed gentry black farmers that I've come across in Ohio were very openly Underground Railroad operatives because who's going to turn you in? You've got everybody on your paycheck. So how did this essential aspect of Ohio's past get missed? Maybe it was not just about the numbers and the visibility. Maybe it was about success. And this is a fact that many historians in the Midwest have had a hard time seeing. As Andrew Caton argued in a book commemorating Ohio's 200th anniversary, and I quote, 
Few blacks lived in nice homes. For most, life was a mixture of poverty and discrimination relieved only by the support of their white neighbors." End quote. This is a common narrative, whether dealing with the Underground Railroad in Ohio or the free people of color who had lived here, a story of white benevolence, paternalism, and power. Whether it led to the victimization or aid, African Americans in Ohio are often represented within the tropes of victimhood and failure. But Caton cannot be blamed too much, for so much of this history has been literally erased from the land, a subject I will return to in a few minutes. But what if African Americans were the ones relieving the poverty of their white neighbors? What if it was their nice homes and their good land that they purchased before their white neighbors ever came to Ohio that touched off this discrimination? What if it was actually their white neighbors they had to protect themselves from, not rely on? What if the facts that shaped the earliest legislations and laws in Ohio concerning African American, concerned African American agency, success, and rising. This is a very different narrative. I'd like to introduce you to one of these pioneering families, Enoch and Deborah Harris. Enoch and Deborah Harris were one of the earliest settlers of the community of Mount Vernon in Knox County, Ohio. And they went on to be the first settlers of South Bloomfield Township in Morrow County. Enoch Harris is in so many ways a black Manessa Cutler, for he was a community founder who then left Ohio. But there are no signs, no halls or restaurants celebrating him. Enoch's story is the local county, from the local county history, sounds like the beginning of a joke. Three men start out on a hunting trip, two white men and a black man. We wait for the punchline, but instead are introduced to a narrative that seems to break with all expectations. Here is the story as recounted in the local county history. Three hunters armed with rifles left Mount Vernon and pushed westward into the wilderness. They desired to hunt outside the outermost log cabin and also desired to see the country westward with a view of locating. These three men were Peter and Nicholas Kyle and Enoch Harris, the latter being a powerfully built mulatto. They entered South Bloomfield Township at the southeast corner, coming from the east and admiring the country, determined to form a settlement. And there follows a long and romantic description of land they were viewing. I will skip that. The prospect was delightful, and with enthusiasm, the hunters entered into their compact. The story of how each of them picks their quarter of the township is important, for it starts with the words, and I quote, Enoch had been there before, and it entered the land. Let me repeat. Enoch had been there before, and it entered the land. And because of his prior entry and knowledge, Enoch Harris was acknowledged as picking and purchasing the best quarter of South Blumfield Township on account, and I quote, of the excellent springs of pure water. What this county history does not tell us is that Enoch fought in the War of 1812 and was a neighbor with an eccentric gentleman called John Chapman, otherwise known as Johnny Appleseed. When Enoch and his wife, Deborah, decided to move their family to Frontier, Michigan, to homestead the 400-acre land grant that he'd been given there in exchange for his services during the War of 1812, he and his family planted the first apple orchard in southern Michigan a state now renowned for its apples. And by the 1850s, they had grown wealthy. Yes, that's a silk waistcoat he's wearing. From the excellent distillery that Enoch Harris was running, his high quality liquor created from the orchard he had planted long before Michigan statehood. And the Harrises were far from, al from alone. By 1850, there were at least 95 rural farming settlements scattered across Ohio, home to propertied African-American farmers. 
Many of them would have looked like the small settlement of Lexington in Columbiana County, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. By 1837, a Quaker visiting the community reported that since its founding in 1821, it had grown to, and I quote, a settlement of 51 families, numbering 264 individuals, altogether 1,860 acres of land valued at over $29,000, end quote. The community had funded and built two schools, I quote, taught by abolition females, end quote, and it also built a meeting house. The meeting house was central to that community of far-flung farmers. It was where they worshiped and their Sunday school met, and it housed their library. Community leaders proudly showed their visitor the library of over 120 books that they had purchased. In 1821, the young white abolitionist Benjamin Lundy came across a sizable African-American settlement on his way to Michigan, about three miles from the village of Somerset. When he visited with them, he found the residents furious. And I quote, wonderfully wroth, as he put it, over their treatment by the whites who were beginning to settle around them. Why? Why would white pioneers work so hard to make the lives of their black neighbors so miserable? A possible explanation is given by Edward Abdi, an eccentric Oxford Don with a strong belief in racial equality, who traveled around the United States in the early 1830s, including a very interesting trip down the Ohio River. Dr. Abdi recorded a thriving African-American farming settlement just outside of Madison, Indiana, where African-American farmers settled some of the best land in the region before statehood. He writes, and I quote, while they were clearing their farms of the timber, they were unmolested. But now that they have got the land into a good state of cultivation and are rising in the world, the avarice of the white man casts a greedy eye on their luxuriant crops, and his pride is offended at the decent appearance of their sons and daughters. And this erasure continues today, because this erasure extends to how this region thinks of itself today, who belongs where. This is not just about how this history is written, it is how it is preserved. This erasure takes energy and even violence. For example, the fine farmhouse that John Langston lived in, in Brownhelm Township, Ohio, when he became one of the first African Americans in the United States to be elected to office in 1855, was deliberately allowed to decay and fall down in the 20th century. In the 1850s, the wealthy African American farmer Augustus West built a home in Fayette County, Ohio, less than 100 miles west of here, that was so grand, all the locals called it the mansion. By the 1970s, the local white farmer who owned the land was using the mansion as his cow barn. The hundreds of acres that the Litchf Litchfords and Depps once owned in what is now Columbus, Ohio, was so dear to them that generations of those families chose to be buried on that land. These graves of these black founding citizens of Columbus have now been paved over for a school parking lot. And the huge home the Clemens family built before the Civil War in Dark County, Ohio, all brick and limestone with beautiful plaster walls and ornate fireplace surrounds is again falling into neglect. This was a family that not only were active underground railroad operatives, but they helped to fund and found the nationally recognized Union Literary Institute, a pre-collegiate collegiate boarding school open to all students, regardless of color, class, or gender, in 1846. And they even encouraged cross-racial dating. It's in the book. Their once grand mansion now has raccoons taking up residence in the grand parlor. Meanwhile, most of the white citizens of Dark County, Ohio, continue to support the preservation of the Beehive Schoolhouse, built as a whites-only school around 1846. 
David McCullough recently defended his focus on white wasp men in his recent book, arguing that he could not include much about Native Americans and women because there were so few sources. His critics have not even mentioned African Americans because they assumed, as do many Americans today, that there were too few in number and of little consequence in the settlement of the Northwest Territory. But this is not a question of scarcity. Indeed, the amount of information about African American pioneers in Ohio is almost overwhelming. The hardest thing I faced about writing the bone and sinew of the land was how much material I found and how little my editor would let me include. As Dr. Schulwalter pointed out this morning in her talk, she presented David McCullough with information on women, including African American women, that he chose not to include. No, there is not a scarcity of information. There is a scarcity of interest. There is a scarcity of funding. There is a scarcity of attention being paid. Now, I want to be clear here. Including the facts from Ohio's past, the move beyond white men can get some interesting labels. New social history, feminist history, African American history, revisionist history. Never just history. Because work, hard work, has gone into creating the idea that neutral, plain old history is a history of white men. But the only reason that history is still viewed as the history of white people is because historians have worked so hard to make it that way. They, over the years, have literally had to shut their eyes and refuse to see what is right in front of them. And that mindset, that construction of what just plain old history is, is based on the immensely hard work that many of the white elite in Ohio undertook to exclude African Americans and Native Americans from their rights and even from the state. And when those white elites in Ohio did this, they opened a Pandora's box of prejudice, a legal and legislative roadmap for other powerful white men in the region west to use as they worked to weave prejudice, exclusion, and to fight equality in the Northwest Territories. So, with so much intent, with so much revision from the whites in Ohio, revised the original intent of the Northwest Territorial Ordinance to the revisionist historians today who continue to work to exclude the people who created some of the best ideals of the, this region, from the egalitarian lifeways of the Anishinaabeg to the work of early African American Buckeyes to further the causes of liberty and equality for all. This work means that the work to undo it will be hard because it took hard work to create this fiction of a white Midwest settled by and for white people. But if we continue to exclude this history, it will continue to have a very real impact on Ohio today. Who is considered to belong? Who is considered not? But this lack of research should not just discourage us. It should encourage us. And I am ending. <laughs> My father has a story he likes to tell about attending a lecture in American history back when he was in college. The professor announced to the class that there really was no more American history to find. It had all been researched and written about. After all, there were multiple books on Lincoln, Washington, and Jefferson, and I would add Manasseh Cutler. So we were done, finished. There's nothing more to find. But there is so much more for us to find. There is so much more for us to understand about Ohio's founding. And without this research that so desperately needs to be done on the full history of Ohio's past, we will not be able to understand where we are today in Ohio, the Midwest, or the nation. And if we lose these histories of the people who embodied the best of the Northwest, we will not be able to move with hope into the future. So with that hope in mind, I'm going to invite Mr. David Butcher up here, a descendant, early African descendant pioneers to Athens, to read a brief excerpt of a speech given at a black convention in the Midwest in 1856. Please bear with me. 
though we all agree that money is power and knowledge is power, let us not forget that more powerful than both these combined is truth. Money and power and the vicissitudes of human life may both be lost or wrested from us, but truth, absolute truth, is eternal. Like a great author, the infinitely wise and gracious God, man may disagree, disregard it for a time until the period arrives when his rays, according to the determination of heaven, irresistibly break through the mist of prejudice. And like the opening of day, shed a clear and unextinguishable light over the generation of men. Thank you. Questions? If you have a question, we'll just bring the mic to you. Okay. Yeah, so if you have a question, please just raise your hand and we'll try to bring your mic to you. Sprint over. And thank you so much for those remarks. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious uh, about the Harris. That's the first time I've seen the Harris. We have a lot of Harrises in Athens mm, County. Mm, yeah. So I know you've done a lot of work, but is, that, uh, is there any connection? Possibly. I have no idea. What a great PhD thesis that would be. <laughs> oh, yeah, um, so you mentioned a bunch of race wars in 1830s yeah. that I'm not really, I didn't learn about those in the mm -hmm. standard American. I certainly learned about the Civil War, mm, the mm. racial aspects of the Civil War, mm. uh, like the draft riots and mm. that sort of thing, but not that. And I was wondering, was it connected to the beginning of, I mean, public education started to sort of take off, but public, you know, what is it called? Publicly funded, mm. whatever you want to call that, you know, grade school sort of education. That's one thing that we learn about the 1850s, I think that's typically presented as positive. Um, mm. But the way you presented those issues in Cincinnati, it sounded like um, the move to bring publicly funded education um, actually um, has some role in um, these race riots. Or? Yeah, great question. So, um, and and I'm not the only historian to write about this, but it's rarely been written from the perspective of all of them that occurred. Um, in fact, as I mentioned in my book, during a three-year period, there were over 86 cities in the North that were hit by these race wars. And just a three-year period. I sometimes think of the 1830s as the dark 30s. Um, it was basically a decades-long Kristallnacht with the, um, the victims being African Americans in the cities of the North. It's how Philadelphia became a segregated city. It's how many cities of the North became segregated, violently segregated. Um, I wish I could say that there was a specific re reason for each. Um, I'm still sort of grappling with what the reasoning is. Uh, we certainly, uh, I include in my book, The Bone and Sinew of the Land, uh, uh, some mention actually from the president, office of the president, um, Jackson, and, and actually some strong work being done by Martin Van Buren to foment violence against African Americans. Possibly, William Lloyd Garrison actually called it. He said, if you convince Northern whites that whites and blacks cannot live together in peace, then you basically have convinced Northern whites that she never ends slavery. Because if you freed all the African Americans and they moved north, then as, as Abraham Lincoln said in the 1860s, there will be a, a war worse than the one we are having now. Right. And he believed that because he had witnessed the 1830s. He'd seen what happened. 
this is an area that needs a lot more research. Um, and that's all I can say. And, and I, I certainly hope that you will um, read about it in my book. But it was um, a very, very difficult decade. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much mm. for, for your work. Mm. Um, looking at the map of Ohio, and you kind of squint. And you can <laughs> see that there's some interesting uh, thoughts of where these clusters are and why mm. they're there. Mm. For example, the Hanging Rock Iron region seems to have a cluster. And in South Bloomfield Township, it was the old wheat belt tied to the inland ports on mm. Lake Erie. But the question I have for you, though, is what about the places on the map where there are no settlements? What, what accounts for the clustering and especially the absences on the map? Great question. Um, that's, that's one of those questions that still needs to be answered. I mean, this book really is just the tip of the iceberg. It's to get people curious. Um, for some of these settlements, you can see they're along waterways. If you're going to be a market farmer, um, you definitely want to be close to the waterways to get your goods to market. Also, I'll be very clear here, this is not all the African-American settlements in Ohio. It's just the farming settlements. So there were other settlements that sprung up around an African-American blacksmith or an African-American um, general store owner or an African-American wheat mill owner, right? I didn't include them because they aren't self-identified as farmers. But there were many more than that. And also there were many more where people did not own land. They might have um, been carpenters or bricklayers or uh, owned a, a massive livery stable. It also does not include any areas that were even vaguely urban. So some of those blank areas may just be because this is a very super conservative map. Uh, that's why I use the example of Michigan to say, if I'd actually included all the African Americans in Michigan in 1850, the whole map would be covered. It's just that this is a very, very conservative kind of Jeffersonian ideal of what a citizenship, citizen should look like, which is property farmer, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I don't know who's got Hello? the mic. Hello? Yeah. Um, so uh, your, the, the, the topic that you're discussing um, clearly has so many uh, implications for um, illuminating social justice movements. Um, so I'm, I was curious about what is your experience and opinion of your, your role for historians doing research like yourself um, in, in those conversations and um, forums of social justice in the now, hmm. and, hmm. and what has your experience been too? Have you been approached by groups um, to share your, your research, et cetera? Huh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, because obviously nothing I've written about here affects the people who live then, right? It's only affecting our present time. Uh, histories, that's what histories do. Um, I certainly wrote it in hopes that it would um, affect how people think um, about their region, because how we think about our past can profoundly affect how we think about our present and our future. Um, I have not, I've not been approached by sort of those kind of organizations, interestingly enough. Um, my main contacts as I was working this were the descendants of the African American pioneers themselves, who have actually been working very hard for a very long time to tell their stories. They just haven't been listened to. So I really feel like I did this in sort of walking alongside of them, bluntly using my whiteness and my sort of high position of privilege to try to get this story out. But I could not have written it without somebody saying to me after sort of knowing me for two years, well, you know, my auntie lives down in um, Houston, and she's been doing genealogy, and you should talk to her. And um, so uh, there's. But you know, there is so much about this history, particularly about the organizations that were occurring, these, this colored convention movement that was happening, which can be, um, it, it had a real difference in Ohio. It's one of the things I wasn't able to mention in this paper, I wish I could, that in 1849, African Americans, many of them based on these farms, were able to overturn some of these racist and unjust black code laws. Um, not all of them, but some of them. And Ohio was the only state where that happened out of the Northwest Territory states. So they actually had some measure of success in what they were doing. So there's ways sort of on the ground that we could look at these as models. Um, they were not just speaking in convention halls. They were using social media in a very savvy way. They were getting it into all the newspapers, right? 
um, all of their speeches. So there's some really interesting, I think a lot of interesting lessons to be learned. Yeah, great question. Yeah. We got two hands up. <laughs> yeah. I'm, oh, I'm yeah. curious about how the uh, African American farmers got there and if you were able to track their status relative to uh, were they freed, were they um, escaped, mm. were they, had they bought their freedom, uh, were mm. you able to track any patterns or were you aware of their status at all? Yes, I was. So great question. Um, so there was a large population of free African descended people in this nation before the Revolutionary War. I mean, there was a population. So many of the people who were settling the Northwest Territory, some of these came from families that had been free since the 1680s. Um, I mean, the Goings can trace their ancestors back to Jamestown so as free people. So these are people with very, very, very deep roots in the New World. Um, and they came with the resources to be able to purchase large amounts of land when they first arrived here, because they would sell the land that they owned in North Carolina or Virginia um, or Pennsylvania or New York or New Jersey and come out to the Northwest Territory and buy massive swaths of land. You can't do that if you've just been freed. Um, however, I open my book with the story of Charles Greer, who was um, born enslaved in Virginia freed during this sort of fervor for freedom that saw the number of free people of color just explode in this nation. I think in a 30 year period, we went from having 58,000 over 300,000 free people counted in the census. Um, and he came out to the Indiana front, territorial frontier in about 1813 with nothing but the clothes on his back. And by the time of his death, he was a wealthy farmer on 250 acres of land. Um, and that was just, you know, the, the Turner thesis has been justly criticized, right? This is the, the, the Turner thesis is the 1890s, the sort of American identity is constructed around the idea of the sort of rugged individual young man going out and becoming a pioneer. But after studying these African-American pioneers, I'm beginning to wonder, maybe the thesis is not wrong. Maybe it's just black. <laughs> it's, worth, it's worth investigating. Yeah. Um. I've got two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is, what does Andrew Caton have in the footnote for that quotation? Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, um, and it kind of goes to the question, I think, of uh, frontier. Mm -hmm. What's the, because you mentioned a lot of the stuff's pre-statehood. For Ohio itself, what's the evolution of when the erasing starts? Does it have to do with the success? I mean, you know, the frontier, if, if you want to, you know, talk about um, the violence of, you know, war against Native Americans, if you want to talk about early days versus later days. I mean, you know, if, if you had to characterize what they go through, whether these black pioneers are accepted in 1800, you know, 1830 mm -hmm. after the canal, and mm -hmm. then 1859. Is there a is is there an arc or a, a change over time? Mm. Um, and first of all, the Andrew Kate, I I don't honestly remember. I don't think the book had a lot of citations. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> but the um, there is definitely an arc. So the Ohio territory and and frontier was first settled during this sort of revolutionary fervor for equality and freedom that really hit a lot of this country. So the 1787 ordinance was not unique. In 1792, when George Washington was running for his second term as president, he was pretty much a shoe in <laughs> um, the, there were 15 states and the Northwest Territory, which doubled the size of this nation, right? 11 of those 15 states had rewritten their state constitutions to have equal voting rights. So that means, if we're talking about original intent or constitutional conservatism, or, there was something going on. Um, I don't include Georgia in that number. That would make it 12. Um, whites in Georgia actually did rewrite their colonial constitution and removed the word white to open up the vote because nobody's actually found any evidence that African -American, free African Americans voted in Georgia. But then again, nobody's really looked. <laughs> so 
there was something going on and I think there was backlash. There was a period, there was absolutely backlash. And I think the backlash is almost in, in response to the levels of success that were being achieved, if that makes sense. I, I don't was, know how much time, more time we have for questions. Um, <laughs> first, for, yeah. first of all, I was thank you very much for your comments on David McCullough and yeah, his yeah. book. Yeah, yeah. Appreciated that. Mm -hmm. And one thing we've heard is that there was a great amount of pride that uh, the territory uh, didn't have slavery. Mm -hmm. On the other hand. Uh, were, were there political reasons that benefited people because there was no slavery in the territory? Let's see, how do I want to say this? There were people perhaps in the South who were glad that there weren't slaves in the North mm. or... <laughs> no. Yeah. Um. The, the, the battle to make the Northwest Territory states free of slavery was constantly being fought. Um, there was just a sort of a general argument constantly being made that you, it's just really almost impossible for white people to settle a frontier without enslaved labor. Um, it's the argument being made by uh, you know white Buckeyes and around state founding who petitioned the federal government numerous times to try to get that order in the ordinance reversed. Um, it's fought for hard by William Henry Harrison, um, who's uh, the young governor of what is called the Indiana Territory, but is actually all the region except Ohio. <laughs> um, and he is petitioning the federal government, I think he petitions them three times to open. He says, just for 10 years. We just need it for 10 years, and then we'll be fine. That man had a real sweet tooth for enslaved labor. He actually brought, illegally brought enslaved people. Um, that's who built Grouse, Grouseland, Grouse, Grouseland in um, Vincennes, his mansion there. And actually I came across an astonishing, um, it's in my book, but an astonishing newspaper article from the 1850s before he became president when he was living in Ohio. Um, and where he took advantage of the um, poorhouse and would purchase African Americans from the poorhouse to work as uh, indentured servants in his home. He just did not want to give this up. And there's actually a runaway slave ad placed in an Ohio newspaper by William Henry Harrison in the 1850s saying that a man that he held in bondage from the poorhouse had run away from him in a description of him. And it looks like something out of New Orleans. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Cox. Yeah. Uh, this was an amazing talk. Thank you so much Thank for doing you. it. Thank um, you. Can't even imagine the legwork that had to go into a project like this. <laughs> the reason it took years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm really fascinated with how uh, you bring out, you flesh out the story of African Americans buying land from the federal government. Mm -hmm. And that makes me think of sort of the larger relationship that the federal government has had with African Americans. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking more so in certain areas such as the Civil War and Reconstruction mm -hmm. and in the 50s and 60s during the Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. where the federal government is sort of this check on, um, on local and state governments trying to enforce uh, segregation and racialized slavery. Mm -hmm. um, yet historians of the early republic show a different story between the federal government uh, that it's actually white slaveholders and control of the federal government are using the state apparatus to push back against uh, freedom uh, to enforce racialized slavery. Oh, the South hated states' rights. Yes. Oh, they just hated them. Yes. <laughs> so I was just curious, um, do you see your work in, in showing how these uh, African Americans are actually using or buying land from the federal government to achieve their sort of Jeffersonian independence? Do you see that as kind of a pushback against uh, some of this literature about the early republic and slavery, and do you see that as another example of the federal government's uh, check on state power? Um, a complicated question. I'll try to answer it very briefly because we're running out of time, um, and I'd be glad to continue this conversation and conversations with anybody else afterwards. But we're good on time. Okay, we're, we're good okay, on time. Okay, as long good, as you've good. got the stamina for it. Okay, all righty, all right. Yeah. So um, these frontier federal land offices had very little connection to the federal government. 
Um, they were kind of run under their own management, and it really depended on who was running them. They're actually known to being highly corrupt. Um, I think it was Bronson in uh, what is now Kalamazoo of Michigan. It was particularly notorious. But it really depended on who was running them and who, how they were doing it. So uh, I wouldn't exactly use the federal, the fact that it was a federal land office doesn't exactly make it a wing of sort of the federal governments because the federal government just didn't have a lot of power or say in that in those offices and in that region. They were sort of run, um, I mean, there's a lot to be said about the frontier's middle ground, right? Um, we think about Richard White's uh, The Middle Ground, but but there is this sort of space. And in fact, as I, as I mentioned in my book, it's, it's ironic that African-descended people are coming to this frontier. They sort of have to escape society and social strictures go to the frontier to to gain the equality that they need, right? Um, and, and so I'm not I'm not sure if, if this is one of those places you can make an overarching argument. Um, but it's a very intriguing question, and I want to hope you will follow up because <laughs> I'd love to find out more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I loved your book. Thank you. Oh, thank uh, you for writing it <laughs> um, and sharing sharing it with us tonight. Mm -hmm. um, I work with local historical societies in mm -hmm. Ohio, mm -hmm. and my question is, what would you tell local historians living mm -hmm. in their communities, doing their community history, what would you tell them um, about how to um, claim that part of their, their area's history, African American history? Okay, so you're, service? yeah, so you mean like white historians at local yeah. white historical, sort of white-centric yeah. historical societies. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've come across a number of um, historical societies in, in Ohio that are also run by African Americans, and they're very much aware. <laughs> like, they don't need me to um, sort of come in and say, you need to study this, because they're already studying it. Um, but I would just encourage them. Um, it's, it's hard, because for a lot of these historical societies, they, they've actually known for a while that that's there. They've, they've been confronted by African Americans who still live in that area, asking that their stories be told. Um, so it's, I, I think if there's a will, there's a way. Um, and interestingly enough, when I was doing my research, I'd often go to local historical societies, and I'd often, I've, I'd often run into this trope of the first and the only, right? Um, so I'd have local white historians say, oh, we had the first black postmaster. We had the first African American settlement or the or the only in whatever. Um, in some ways that's important. If it's African Americans saying, saying that, they're trying to sort of stake their claim to the extremely scarce resources that um, state Midwestern states in particular allocate to African American history. Um, and and I'll just be clear here. I mean I know we're in Black History Month, but um, I sometimes feel like the field of history is almost is almost sort of corrupted by that idea we have about the one drop rule, right? Like if you if you start talking about like even just one African American, all of a sudden it becomes African American history. This is American history. This is Ohio history, right? We can't we can't actually understand what happened in a county or a region unless we understand this. But for some of these um, white sort of presidents of, of um, historical societies, this is this has kind of been a deliberate erasure. I remember uh, talking to the president of County Historical Society, and um, I said, you know, in the census record, it says by 1840, um, there were 40 land-owning African-American families here, and um, just wondering what kind of material you have before I come out and, and do some further research. And there was a really long pause on the other end of the phone. <laughs> the guy said, I have no idea what you're talking about. We are a German settlement. We arrived here in the 1870s, but we have a great Oktoberfest. You need to come out here and check it out, right? Um, so uh, questions about who settled where, when, really do matter because there's so many claims to um, belonging that are about who got here first, right? And who is allowed to be here? Um, so these are complicated stories. I hope that people would find it in their hearts to overcome prejudice and and open up, you know, history to all the their whole history. Um, 
And in some cases, the way around that is this odd um, conversation I've heard a number of times where sort of white presidents of um, county historical societies or township historical societies will say to me, oh, well, you know, the African Americans in our county, they were really, they were really unusual. They were really hardworking and they were really successful. Those other ones in the other county, I don't know, they were kind of lazy. But um, it's sort of this weird sort of paternalism. Like we can talk about them because they're kind of ours. Um, but it isn't, it's got to go beyond that. Um, so that's a really, really tough question because so much of an historical society's identity is wrapped up. Um, I think about when I first did research in Greenville um, in the genealogical collection there, and some of their earliest and, and largest landowners were black in that county. But uh, when she gave me the um, file on uh, the pioneers of of Dark County, Ohio, there wasn't a single black name in there. Not one. They, they, they didn't exist. Um, and that was only about eight years ago. So, um, and, and they knew they were there. <laughs> uh, so I, I would say, I just hope that people will decide that it's okay to include that um, and include that history. Does that make sense? <laughs> Hi. Um, so when you're doing research on um, groups of people that are typically unrepresented or underrepresented in history, um, in your opinion, what is some of the most important questions to ask yourself and things to keep in mind when you're conducting this research? Mm, great question. Um, have an open mind. Um, and, and also try to listen. Um, in in uh, a number of the counties that I went to, there were still African Americans there um, who knew their histories. And um, I, you know, it's really, really important to sort of humble yourself and say, there's a lot here I don't know. Um, and try to get beyond that sort of first and only trope. Um, because that's particularly narrowing. You know, if you think it's the only, you won't look for more. If you think it's the first, you won't look further back, right? Um, and I don't know. I I just I love the language of some of the the early patriots in this country. People like James Otis. I actually quote him in the beginning of my book. And they and they talked about the way that they don't talk about racism. That's a 20th century term. They use the word prejudice. And I think that that is such a great term. And the way that they describe prejudice is it's something that infects the individual and it hardens their heart, right? This is pre-Freud. So they're not talking about words like empathy and stuff. But it, it basically, the number of times, like James Otis says, um, for those people who are prejudiced, their hearts are like the nether millstone. Like I'm just seeing him pointing at a millstone. He's talking about racial prejudice among other white men. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's about just having a sense of empathy for the people of the past and realizing that the, the real history of this nation is a history of a diverse people interacting with each other, whether um, negatively or positively, that it's there. And that if we leave out there their stories. We've got a very incomplete idea of, of our past. Yeah. I hope that, for what it's worth. <laughs> well, I, I also just want to point out that we have some some real legends here who can help with the answer to some of these que questions. You've already heard from from David Johnson, Ada Ada Adams, who is uh, the director, former director of the of the Multicultural Heritage Center in Chester Hill, has been doing this sort of work here in our community for a very long period of time, and we're thankful she could join us here. She's going to be with us tomorrow uh, as well, and hopefully we'll hear from her at the at the roundtable. Uh, I also um, want to just make make mention. You you mentioned the the, the concern of of erasure. Um, people in this community have a chance to help uh, counter. Uh, act that. Uh, Mount Zion Baptist Church uh, is going through right now an effort for renovation. And in fact, next Friday, uh, 
um, there's going to be a showing of the movie River of Hope at the Athena uh, Cinema uh, with the proceeds going to help the, the preservation and restoration of that very important site in African American history here. So those of you who are here, those of you who are watching this on live stream, uh, please consider attending that and looking to contribute in, in, in other ways. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cox, for this wonderful uh, performance. Thank you all for being here. We have food and, and, and drink uh, awaiting you outside, uh, and we hope to see Many of you here tomorrow when we resume. And I think copies of my book for sale, which yes, I'm willing to sign. Absolutely, there if, are copies of the book. If properly, uh, absolutely. Thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> uh, so please make you make use of that. And um, thanks again so much. Thank you.